Welcome everyone to Wednesday's Dive Into the Mind with Helen and Tony. We love talking about the mind, its tricks, its beauty, and, and our role in, in working with it to, to embrace and live in a state of unconditional happiness. That is our topic for this week, unconditional happiness, and how we can be in a place of surrender and trust and and also even acknowledging kind of both sides of the coin of like where we've come from and what that is and then where we're going and what we're looking for and and how unconditional happiness plays a role in all those parts. Welcome again, Helen. It's great to see you. Tell me a little about unconditional happiness and what it means for you. Um, so unconditional happiness I was reading uh, The Untethered Soul today and when I heard the term unconditional happiness, it really landed for me in terms of, I'd heard different ways of accepting the situation as though you'd chosen it yourself. And unconditional happiness is pretty much just saying that your happiness has no conditions on it. So here's a situation, let's just say we had a tech failure. My negative emotions, would make no difference to the outcome of the tech failure mm. so just choose it with uh, be open to it like don't shut down don't create a story about it don't create resistance because the minute that you create resistance you create inner turmoil your heart shuts down yeah. and then and then you just create this negative drama story about it so unconditional happiness would just be the situation it kind of is what it is and to keep your heart open with every situation as it's unfolding. Yeah, amazing. And also like knowing that when you shut down, then you block maybe how that might go in the future, whether that's like after that tech failure or whatever it is, it's really quite fascinating how the knock-on effects of that moment can kind of adjust the, the future or the path, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, even if it's just for the next 10 to 15 minutes, like let's just say you had a tech failure and then you had to answer the phone and that was an important phone call with the client. <laughs> like if you were in a closed off state and you weren't able to just turn it around really quickly and kind of go, okay, I'm switching into my positive open mode because I love my client. Like yeah. if you carried that through with you, then that could really have some serious knock on impacts in your life. Yeah, amazing. And it applies in so many different ways. Again, it all comes back to, you know, good old Tony Robbins and emotional mastery of being able mm -hmm. to, you know, instantly accept what is happening and be happy that no matter where you thought you were going to be or what was going to happen, like you're instantly accepting the happiness in that moment and knowing that like this is all, you know, just let it go, move it through your body and keep moving. Yeah. And he talks about something, he talks about identifying the conditions for your happiness okay. in particular situations. And then he makes you work through it with um, like a, a change the conditions for your happiness. But unconditional happiness is just, you're not even changing the conditions. <laughs> it's just like the situation is what it is. If it's raining outside, and you're miserable because the sun's not shining your misery is not going to change the fact that it's raining outside yeah so so, so why be miserable like yeah what does it achieve nothing it's yeah. just be miserable yeah amazing yeah. like it's really unconditional which you know apply that in every part of your life it's like i will have unconditional happiness no matter what i hear see feel taste do yeah what's shown at me what's not shown yeah. to me it's it's i'm gonna play with that this week so here's uh here's a great conversation we did it on instagram live again today thank you so much for your time i love these conversations and um and i love you very much thank you i love you too all right over to the episode everyone have a great week and we'll see you next week waiting for helen to join us time travel going on we're going to talk about time travel today here she is hi darling Hi. Hello. Hello. How are you? Great. <laughs> oh, good. Thanks. Huh? Uh, I was just saying that I'm, I love sharing my journey and I think sharing what we learn about ourselves and how we learn it is such a huge part of then, um, 
I don't know, passing on the wisdom so that others can learn and others can, um, I don't know, shift their lives too. It's very exciting. In, in so, a quicker way as well. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, like, I mean, we, I think we keep talking about like there's no silver bullet, but at the same time, like there's a way that you can, if you can see someone go through the physical steps of something, it helps them yeah. to uh, to shift their world. So today we're going to talk about a little bit about time travel and diving into our minds <laughs> about what we would, um, what would we say to our younger self? as we go through the stages of our lives with, with a knowing now that sort of like, you know, um, enlightenment you were talking about as you read Michael Singer's book, The Untethered Soul, one of our favorites mm -hmm. again, it was sort of like um, enlightenment, you know, is kind of the awareness of unconditional, unconditional happiness. happiness. Yeah. yeah, go on, tell us a little bit about that, jump in and then we're gonna talk about yes. this. So I think um, uh, for those of you that haven't read the book, it's a fantastic book. I'm reading it. This is the fourth time I'm reading it in maybe 10 years. Uh, and every time I read it, I kind of get something else from it. Um, so th what I picked up this week was unconditional happiness. Like we, we always talk about unconditional love and it's like, mm -hmm. how do you love somebody unconditionally? And if you really love them unconditionally, you'll set them free and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, do you know what I mean? Like, like there's yeah. a lot of things that society says about unconditional love. And then they talk about like society. And when I say society, I mean, books, media, mm -hmm. Instagram, they talk about happiness and all the happiness they talk about is conditional. Mm. Like, you know, here I am with my glamorous photo, sipping my cocktail by a pool, or I'm traveling, or I have a new purchase of some sort, or I've, or I've got eyelash extensions or something. And this has all been set up as what happiness is or what people could aspire to, to be happy. But it doesn't really talk about unconditional happiness. Mm. And in the book, Michael Singer talks about we as human beings create suffering by wanting our, our lives to be different. So mm. by not accept, and this is where the term unconditional happiness is like, yeah. if somebody had explained it to me, like uncon be unconditionally happy, I could have grasped that concept a long time ago, but but, you know, practicing happiness or being happy, like, how do you know what happy is? Because happiness for me is, is this, you know, this state of perfection, whereas unconditional happiness is accepting every moment as it is. Yeah, I was just about to say, it's all about acceptance, because I think, I don't know if acceptance has only really come to me in a, like, clear and um, embodied way in the last few weeks around like surrender is acceptance and acceptance is surrender. And I think that, you know, we, we talk about like happiness of the goals that we want. And again, you know, in the constructs of time and space, we're like, you know, I want to be here by X and I want this, this, and this, and that's all kind of outside of ourselves. Whereas if in yeah. this moment, like I am happy and I am unconditionally happy, no matter how funky or I don't have those goals mm -hmm. or, or any of those pieces of the puzzle, then I know that I can be happy in this moment. And that unconditional sort of element to it is what brings the freedom and what actually I think feeds the true happiness of which then breeds more happiness and then you know that then maybe we could say manifests or brings in more happiness i mean it you know that that's the side the spiral of life it either goes up or down in some shape or form yeah because what he also talks about is the heart being open and the heart being closed mm -hmm. and every time you're happy your heart is open and he gives a great example of you know you've gone out with somebody they've broken up with you you're depressed mm -hmm. you have no energy they then call you up and they go no I want to get back together with you and then all of a sudden within an instant you're yeah. like you're all lit up right and you're lit yes. up because your heart is open yes. and that's where the energy okay. is coming from whereas before you were your heart was closed and you were shut down which is why you lacked energy so he talks about this process of keeping the heart open and if you're on by by default if you're unconditionally happy all the time, your heart is open, which means that you have energy. So, mm. I mean, is it really that simple? 
Does it sound that simple? <laughs> I mean, I think it does. And I think, you know, again, if everything, you know, whatever happiness begets happiness. So if you're in this place where you're truly happy in what you have, then I think it brings more. And again, we get back into the sort of spiral concept. Let's go back a little bit of maybe even if we pick some like time frames of being sort of in our growth period like from a child to you know teen adolescent that kind of thing mm -hmm. um like what what um what lessons would you share or sort of <laughs> you know things would you share with your younger self because i think you know we were talking slightly before about like you know when you're a kid there's an unconditional happiness that kind of comes because there's sort of you know a freedom or a heart you know you're in a heart open space that you're mm -hmm. just kind of bouncing from you don't really know and whilst you might be mad in one second when um you know you don't get your uh your lollies or your candy or something but there's yeah. a different sort of sense than what we are now where we look at it like well i don't have this 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 and this therefore i can't be happy until i get those you know it's a lot more um yeah laden with pressure maybe yeah i think maybe as a kid you kind of you, you always had play Mm -hmm. as a distraction to I didn't get that mm -hmm. lolly from the milk bar or whatever mm -hmm. whereas as an adult um and maybe as a teenager let's 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 speak about teenagers so as okay. a teenager you're always well where's my life going like what do mm -hmm. I need to do to get there was this mm -hmm. grade good am I performing in sport like there was never mm -hmm. really a time that you could just be um, mm -hmm. especially, especially with a first generation ethnic background, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, so, so obviously people have different backgrounds. What I find here in Dubai is that a lot of people, this isn't their first home. Uh, so their parents move here, there are expectations for them. And I think as a teenager, when you're constantly falling short of expectations, that builds up a lot of pressure and it's not unconditional happiness. And are those expectations your own and societal, no doubt? A societal familiar. I would say yeah. yeah yeah primarily familial um with the expectation of you know proving it to society mm -hmm. and then um and then if you fall short of that then mm. your your self-worth and your value are diminished right at such a young age as well like you're, you're constantly seeking for external acknowledgement and validation and this is something that can run in certain areas of your life for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, amen. Um, <laughs> no, I, no, it's really not that good. Yeah, <laughs> I know. True. I mean, no, but I yeah. definitely think it's been happening. That's what I, I'm, I'm aiming, amening to. I, I can also see that um, when I was sort of in college, I... I was very studious and even through school, like, you know, I never not turned in an assignment. I never not, you know, went to school and you know in hindsight I, I there are times where I you know think that I didn't need to be that studious and that intense around it like it, nothing was that deep mm -hmm. you know I think you know I was going to pass all this kind of feeling that you needed to get these results or mm -hmm. you know you needed to get these um uh sort of accolades or something like that and, and I definitely look at that as I have grown through my time of like you know, whilst I, I'm not really the type to like not turn something in on time, but it's really more about like, you know, what does that mean now? And what does that mean for the future? I'm not sure. Welcome back. So we've back. just lost Tony for a moment. Uh, so I just wanted to can you continue to talk about unconditional happiness. Um, we were talking about what advice would you give your younger self? Say and that in again, terms of what I, 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 we dropped out, yeah, go back. I, yeah, I was just saying that. Um, what advice I would give my younger self, like mm -hmm. my teenage self, mm -hmm. about um, how to maybe approach things differently. And when I say younger version, teenage self, so so you still got that inner child living there within you. Mm -hmm. So any um, event that may have been um, traumatizing however you define trauma that mm -hmm. still lives within you and it's still a trigger mm -hmm. so let's just say mm -hmm. you know for valentine's day you went up and you gave somebody a card and they ran away from you or something mm -hmm. um that would still kind of live within you and mm -hmm. 
what you could say to that younger version of you is that no matter what you feel about that situation, it's not going to change it. So you may as well just let it go. Let it go. And, and letting go, I think, is if we all learn to just let go and to stop analysing, you know, diagnosing, um, you know, going through the scenario analysis of every single thing that could have happened with a particular person. I'm just kind of, okay, I'll just let it go next. Yeah. Like, I think that that's a healthy way to kind of live life. Look at so many things. Yeah. I, I look back to, um, you know, junior high or whatever it was. And mm. there was one time I was like, I don't know if it's in America, I have it in America, but I was dacked. <laughs> in the in the quadrangle <laughs> in front of all the kids do you want to explain that too <laughs> so basically you know when you have your pants fall down i mean it's not um it wasn't it, it was not enjoyable and it was pretty like traumatic and i think it was related to um there was like a a guy that i was keen on or whatever and some girl liked him and she thought i was with him or he was with me you know and not mm. within any sort of context it was really just like child play in the school grounds and um and that it was actually her or her a friend of hers that did it to me to kind of get it back and i mean it was it was pretty like to have that done brutal to, right? uh, yeah i mean you think about it like to have it done to you period let alone to have it done to yeah. you in front of everybody let alone to have it done to you by another girl yeah and and let alone to have it done to you over a situation that you hadn't really actually done anything apart from maybe expressed interest in someone like you know, I always thought about that for a long time of how that sort of impacted mm -hmm. my psyche within school of always feeling, um, I don't know, maybe scared that I couldn't reach out and talk to people or, I, you know, kind of became quite hermiting in some way, you know, I was yeah. always a bit of a, um, I don't know, like, again, going back to the studiousness, I was always a bit of a study uh, freak. So, you know, I would hang out in the library at lunchtime because I was safe in there and I didn't have to like be exposed to the kids and stuff like that. And it is, mm -hmm. that stuff was interesting how it, um, you know, affected my, um, certainly my unconditional happiness in a sense, you know, mm -hmm. and fun, like I didn't really have fun at school. Like school wasn't fun for me. I didn't mm -hmm. play and, and run around and do mm -hmm. stuff or whatever. I was always sort of like on edge of like where I was gonna, you know, be attacked or something I don't know it, it was interesting <laughs> and um, and you probably find that uh there, there may have been other situ situations in your life where where people would have where people would have reminded you of the people that were in that situation and your automatic instinct is going to be to kind of pull back withdraw yeah so so yes. you know that that younger version of you is still living in you and that younger version of you is going to be triggered if you've not let go of that yeah of that event yeah. or you've reprocessed it in a different way yeah i definitely think it probably channeled into the not belonging and we spoke a little bit yeah. about that last week that for me yeah. that you know feeling excluded from things and you know yeah. i think on one level i was never um you know, I was always into different things. You know, I had horses at one point and I was always into different things than maybe the school kids were. And therefore I I was never in the main, you know, the sort of like standard circles. Cool yeah. yeah, well, and, and maybe like not necessarily that's just the cool kids, but just sort of like, I was always like ahead of where they were at and thinking and doing, you know, mm. I wasn't sitting around being yeah. like, I'm just gonna like smoke ciggies and chill out. I was like, you know, I'm going to go to study and go to university and I'm going to travel. Yeah. Like it was always kind of fast forwarding. So I, I think there was an early stages of excluding myself probably for safety and protection, but then that then festered into something where, you know, in later years, then I felt like, you know, that I'm, I don't, I'm not included or I'm not involved. And it then touched something, definitely something, yeah. um, you know, so do you, do you generally do you generally feel like you have to make more of an effort and you're always the first one reaching out because of not belonging or being excluded yes i think that um as extroverted as i am and seem and my and as able as i am to integrate and connect with all different people i'm often more reserved of kind of putting myself into a group situation 
you know, probably for that same sort of wound of like, well, if they don't like me or if I don't get it included, then I'll just be out of it anyway and I'm not going to spend much time and energy to get involved. So I definitely have seen that come come through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 What a great. So what would you tell your younger self knowing all this now? Yes. Um, I would tell her, I think... Oh, I, I think that, I think back then I thought it was me and that I was bad or not good enough or I was um, not fun or, you know, all of the things maybe. And, and I think what I now realize is, well, you know, I don't even remember who these people are really in, in, in this specificness, but, you know, it was most likely their stuff that they were dealing with. And that's how they took it out to, to be able to cope with their own things. And, and so actually it probably had nothing to do with me. I might've been a trigger for them in terms of maybe because I yeah. was confident to go up and speak to the guy or, or whatever, um, or even to express myself of like, I was interested in him or this, that, and the other. And so mm -hmm. I, I would say to, um, to not go quiet, to not, um, to not close your voice, to not close your heart and keep, keep expressing who you are and keep standing up for what you like and, and, um, and know that actually that's more of an indication of them than it is you. And, and this is not something mm -hmm. that's meant for you to shut down over. This is meant for you to get stronger through, which is, I guess is kind of what happened, but in a longer route than maybe, <laughs> than, 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 you know, it could have been back then, but you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> But now that you know what you know, you're going yeah. to just kind of like exponentially just work through it all. Or like let it yes. all go or reprocess or know that you do belong and all those sorts yeah. of wonderful things. Yeah, that's a beautiful way of saying it. Yeah. Um, so um, so tell us a little more about uh what you would have reprogrammed as a child in that kind of teenage years? Uh, I think, I th it, it would have definitely been people behave based on what they're experiencing. It, it's mm -hmm. never really about you. It's, it's mm -hmm. always about them, mm -hmm. like 99% of the time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other thing might be is that you know, don't beat yourself up if you're mm. not achieving perfection, because if that's the standard that's been set for you, then, um, then yeah, then, then don't beat yourself up about it. How would you even describe perfection to, to your younger self? Like, you know, in being able to sort of like free up the space around perfection and around like being happy in the moment that what is happening in the mm. moment and sort of the concept of the present moment, because I, you know, we haven't even touched on that. Like, I think yeah. you know, maybe as kids we're, we're, we live in the present moment, but then all of a sudden it shifts when everything starts kind of needing, you know, to have results or something. Yeah. It's the expectations. So the mm. expectations were high and achieving the expectations would have been perfection. Mm -hmm. So the expectations were, you know, get 99. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're one fall short of 99, which is quite an easy thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> Once always falling short. <laughs> how, that's hilarious. But was that you? Was like, how did you know that 99 like was a thing? Like, where did that come from? It's just, you know, immigrant parents. They just want right. you to do the best that you can. Right. Um, and, and that was typical for like a lot of people that I knew, mm -hmm. like, you know, they just want you to do better, be better than, than the opportunities that your parents had. Like, okay. you know, my parents yeah. were, yeah, they were blue collar workers and, mm -hmm. you know, they struggled in a foreign country and mm -hmm. English wasn't their first language. So, mm -hmm. so there was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people that had that same experience that I had mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah it was always like you know 95 99 they were the, <laughs> the golden marks yeah 
It's so interesting. <laughs> and, and how did you beat yourself up when you were, you know, in that kind of time frame of your life? What did that look like? And maybe even compared to now? Yeah, how did it I don't, yeah, I don't think that there was necessarily the concept of beating yourself up. It's like, okay, well, the next time you just study harder. Right. I think back back then that was the notion of well just study harder, but then as you progress, um, you know, as you kind of, you know, I don't know, maybe during university I kind of go, well, I was working, so I applied a minimum amount of, you know, I, I just wanted the bare minimum. And then I was like, oh well, actually I possibly could have applied myself a bit more and I don't know how that right. would have impacted um you my results would have been but different if yeah what what more could you have achieved if you had applied yourself more I think you know what that um it's the here's what the I think it's the mindset of here is what the goal was and you fell short and you just continue that habit of setting goals that you always fall short of mm. and even though you achieve a lot you're always falling short of the goals and if you never look at what you achieve and I think we spoke last week about self-validation I've been speaking to quite a few people about that this week it's like yeah when do you when do you acknowledge like really acknowledge what it is that you've done because we're, yes. we're always taught to externally from as a child you're always seeking external validation mm -hmm. but you're never really told well you know you're 12 years old now, you should be able to acknowledge what you've done well and what you haven't done well, and you should be self-regulating and self-correcting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then that means we're not all going to go around and kind of go, oh, look at me, somebody acknowledge me, somebody acknowledge me, and then when nobody <laughs> acknowledges you, and then when nobody acknowledges you, you just kind of go, oh, oh, am I not worthy? Did I not do, was it not good enough for, like, like it's yeah. this, this internal self-acknowledging. Yeah, it's is so interesting. an important concept. Yeah. And I think um, it's also, I think, you know, we've talked a little bit about light and dark and, and, and the Untethered Soul talks about light, light and dark a little bit too. But um, I, I was writing the other day in my morning pages, you know, I, I know that everything that I went through got me to this moment. And then I know that everything that I'm visioning or expecting or wanting or goaling for the future is is that and yet where i am right now what what where the light and dark for me comes in is that like all i can see at times is the difference between where i am now and where i am not versus yes. yeah. where i've been and where i've come from and what i've actually done to this present moment which is all that we have and that was huge yeah like so huge yeah. and very like, um, I don't know, like really heartwarmingly kind of inner child stuff of just actually yeah. like, and also if, if I then bring in my, you know, my, you know, spiritual thinking or my 5D thinking of like, you know, well, we, we only have the present moment and everything that comes from to the future will come from my thoughts now. And, you know, mm -hmm. at the same time, um, how I, how I relax into now or how I accept into now will also mm -hmm. dictate my, um, not dictate my future, but will also feed into the manifestation of my futures and things like that. So, you know, as I'm, I'm playing this self experimentation with myself right now that like, you know, I've always come from a place of like force and will and get at my desk every day and like work, work, work and make it, you know, and then it's like, okay, so if I'm really trusting and I'm in really a sense of faith and I'm really mm -hmm. in a sense of like embodiment of understanding, you know, gods and angels and the guides and asking for help and being supported. Like, I, you know, I'm covering a lot of, you know, concepts or whatever here, like then being in this present moment and actually savoring and, and deliciously, um, recognizing acknowledging enjoying appreciating mm -hmm. the um the the moments and what i have achieved to this point will will and can only fuel the future 
of where I'm right. meant to be going and, and to fill that gap, but to yeah. fill that gap in a way that like spirit yeah. is going to help me do versus me being the one that's saying I'm going to do it and me sitting yeah. in the vibe of, well, I'm not that now. So I'm shit and everything's shit. Yeah. So, so when you look at the gap of where you want to go yes. and you tell yourself the stories, those stories, how does your heart feel? Does it Funny. feel open or closed? Closed. closed? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think, and then you when know, you think go, yeah. And then when you think about everything it is that you've done for the past year or for the past three to five years, like Ooh, how open does your heart feel? Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I'm going to practice that. I, I think and then if that you, if you took action from that open heart, what do you think mm -hmm. that's going to give you? Yeah. Open heart, open mind, ideas. Like. Yeah. Genius. Yeah. And I think that's what I, you know, that's really beautiful. I, I think this is the amazing thing about awareness and, you know, spirituality and consciousness, whatever words you want to say. And I think, you know, yeah. often when I talk about all of this, you know, some people, you know, can get hung up on the words, like what's ascension, what's consciousness. It's all yeah. just like awareness and understanding of ourselves. And, yeah. and I've never looked at it from that angle of like open heart and closed heart. I know I've started to identify with how it feels in my body and yeah. that that's definitely been playing into you know kind of how it feels and also then this sense of faith and trust that i know that when yeah. i'm in an open heart place that you know the synchronicities and the things fall into place and everything comes so it's yeah that's really beautiful yeah yeah there's something that um has come up with me over the past couple of weeks and it's all around um high performance either coaches or athletes mm -hmm. that I've come across lately. Mm -hmm. And they all talk about being in flow. Mm -hmm. And when they talk about, when they talk about being in flow, mm -hmm. and if you, if you just pick, I'm going to pick um, Usain Bolt okay. because I think he, he is the entertainer and the joker when he goes out on the field. Mm -hmm. So what's his heart? His heart's going to be like open and his heart's got to be, um, you know, he's engaging with people, is interacting with them. Mm -hmm. And then the minute that he gets into his performance, he like he snaps and he gets into serious business mode. Right. And then he continues and then he, then he races his race. But his heart is open throughout the entire time. Can you imagine if an, an athlete was kind of going, well, I've not run this fast. I've not run this fast. I've not run this fast. And that's how they start their race. Like they don't start yeah. their race with the gap of, with that gap saying, I've not done this before. They're like, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I'm going to do this and I've done this and I've done all the mm. preparation to do this and I'm going to achieve it, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So no matter who is listening to this and you, you're right, you can call it 5D consciousness, whatever it is you want to talk about it. But high performance athletes have been using this for such a long period of time mm -hmm. where they've been focusing on the gain and on the training and everything that's going to get them set up to deliver the result. Mm. And but we, we as new mortals, we as <laughs> non professional athletes, we as yeah. non professional athletes just kind of haven't really cottoned on to, to, that. to that way of being. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, that's really special. And I think um, kind of applying that in all parts of my life. I'm excited to do because I, I know how, um, like I've had a taste of it. When I was horse riding last week upstate, I I had a, it was really nice to come back to horse riding with a conscious mind. Um, I felt like I, it, it clicked to me that I was this, you know, human on another animal and that I could have a conversation with it and I could, you know, affect its behavior and all of those things through sort of the the journey of being in a um, an exchange with it. And I had some moments where like, I, I would say some fear came through of like how to do this again and how to ride horses and, and you know, we jumped some jumps and some little things like that. and. And in my head, I ha had to really make a switch and keep my heart open. And, and I don't know if I would have used those words or that concept at the time, but it really was like, you've done this before. You've done this like to extreme levels. Like how I yeah. often look back at photos and things. I don't know how I jumped 
and rode horses to the level I did because now the thought of it scares the shit out of me. But there was something <laughs> back then that was so open and free. And so I was like, I, I really had to sink in to like, you've been here, you know what this is. And this is a sort of collective remembering to some degree. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was really beautiful to kind of sink into that feeling of, you know, yeah. that um, I can use all of the experiences of my past to fuel my future rather than look at the yeah. lack of what I cannot do in this moment, which was really yeah. special. Yeah. Beautifully said. Aww. So, okay, let's change to like maybe um, what age, like let's say 20s. When we first, oh gosh. Ma- we first landed in London, what would you, um, what would you say? Was the, like the younger self lesson from that? Oh, the younger self lesson from that. I think my life in London was radically different to my life in Australia. Um, okay. So for me, in Australia so before me, you left for London. Yeah, before I left. Yeah, I just think um, there's just you know that sense of freedom and travel, and um, you know, I think it was like the world is your oyster type mentality, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. I've never mm-hmm. felt in Australia. I don't know why, but. <laughs> I know, I know everybody wants to move to Sydney, but for me, it feels like a prison sometimes. That, right. That's, that's my inner story that I, that I need to resolve. Mm-hmm. Um, but what would I tell my younger self? Uh, I don't know. I was really enjoying what, life. Like about then. work? What, what would you tell your uh-huh. younger self? Like as you, maybe we can map it into like as you came to dubai and then you started to have your sort of breakthroughs around your management style and and your ability to to see people how would you see the helen that was like the boss then to the helen that's the boss that became the boss in dubai i'd say work for me has always been easy like work and finances Mm -hmm. have always been easy and even Mm -hmm. um you know having great friends for me it was more the relationship piece that was yeah that was, that was the part where you know you get into these like intense relationships and then you're out of them and then you're in another intense relationship and then you're out of it and I've had like a couple of those but um so in terms of the management style I think if I could tell myself actually you do have the ability to achieve more than you ever thought that you could in your career because mm. I never thought that I'd be I mean I thought maybe I might top out at managing a couple of people mm-hmm. <laughs> which looking which is just ridiculous looking back now but, yeah. <laughs> um, but you really thought that like you'd never go beyond that or you didn't know how to do it or that's uh, ne- never thought a yeah just it was never really never thought I was maybe capable of it okay but then when you realize you're kind of like, well, when you look at other people and you kind of go, well, I could do that. I could do that. Okay. Um, I think I had, for some reason, I mean, I would have classified my younger self as being very shy. Mm-hmm. And there's an element of work, especially when there's an analytical side to the role that you do, you're either right or you're wrong. Mm-hmm. And then, or, or you have the best solution at the time versus mm-hmm. what anybody else can provide because you're the one that's done the analysis okay. um, and, and that gives you a sense of confidence so there may have been like this incredibly outwardly confident person that maybe then showed up in the personal side mm-hmm. but if there was something that I could have told that younger version it's just about stop being so shy that's mm. yeah and you, what would you have told your 20 something old self? Well, go back for a sec. Like, why do you think you were so <laughs> shy? Like, what was the shyness like protecting or preserving or something? I don't know if that's the right word. Like, where did that come from? It came from, it just came from never really feeling like I fit in. Mm-hmm. Like, I grew up with like a lot of boys. So all the family friends were, were boys um school I didn't really participate in sports it was all just study 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 
Yeah. Um, so in terms of just fitting in, like we didn't have a big extended family. So even that network of, you know, when you look at, so you've got school friends, you've got family friends, you've got your immediate family or your extended family. It was literally just my small immediate family that I had. So for me, it was just like, I was the wrong gender growing up, basically. Right. Yes. <laughs> like, so, so in terms of, um, I have more of a direct communication style and I'm not going to label it as masculine or feminine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's often been the cause of frustration in relationships mm, okay. <laughs> with men. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's, um, I mean, there's an invitation for some acceptance and some, uh, <laughs> I don't know, some unconditional love and happiness that you could bring to yourself. In unconditional that happiness, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I think it's hilarious now. It's absolutely hilarious now. Yeah. But, but back then, now that I understand it, it's hilarious. But back then it was like, well, when you don't have the words to understand it, and it was not something that people kind of spoke about. It's like, you look feminine, so therefore you technically should be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as girly as the other girls. But I never... Mm -hmm felt like that growing up mm. yeah interesting yeah I um so going back to what you're what you would have told your 20 something self yes what I would have told my 20 something self in London was to not take second best or to not settle or mm -hmm. to not um to not accept something for the sake of something yeah and i think i have a lot of um a lot of uh, certainly in the personal relationships um you know romantic stuff i i think i always took i don't even know if i want to say i want to took scraps but like i didn't mm. really i was always kind of looking for love in areas where it wasn't going to come or wasn't coming and mm. therefore um and then therefore disappointed when it when it didn't kind of mm. become what I wanted it to be or even um develop in the way that I believed it should and where did that belief come from like if you could kind of first memory first memory where you were like yeah i think um you know without putting a sort of time and a place to you know enforcing it, i think you know my parents in a sense of like um you know maybe not really seeing a true example of um you know like love at its best and you know love as as in an as an engagement of two people working through things and love as you know relationships and things of, of the sort of, um, you know, commitment to something like that. And so therefore I, I sort of saw that, you know, you, it's better to sort of maybe take what you can get to get instead of being on your own. And, and, and even though I think that my aloneness, like I left home when I was 14 and, um, like I, I became very independent from a very early age, but I also have had a lot of long distance, sorry, long distance and long term relationships from a very young age. Like mm -hmm. basically from 13, 14, I was in long term relationships, you know, an hour, an hour I was going to say, a, a year, you know, or more at a young age. And, you know, that's, that's horrifying to look back at. I think, you know, think about my younger self and my daughters, you know, in the future, I would, not to want that for them at that age but um I think it was such a desire to be loved and such a desire to have companionship and such a desire to be mm. um looked after and such a desire to be wanted mm -hmm. maybe any of those things um and therefore it kind of grew quite early and, and sort of attached itself and then I didn't really know how to shake myself of that emptiness without searching for someone else to help fill it. Because I, mm. you know, also probably at the age too that I separated from my 
artistic sort of things, you know, the horse riding and the ballet and stuff like that, mm -hmm. I, I then went into a place where it was just looking for it for boys or men to to fill that space instead of myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so you'd go back and you'd tell that 20 something version to kind of not accept second best, mm -hmm. but how would, how would that, what would that 20 something year old then have to be doing to not accept the second best? Like what actions would she have had to have taken? I think a combination of things. I want, I think having an outlook for her creative exploration and development mm -hmm. of self you know I think that I wasn't very mindfully developing myself I was sort of yeah. existing in a um yeah. you know the constructs of of work and being very busy and traveling and partying and all of those things mm -hmm. and and while I think yeah. they were all great and, and I loved it and I think it helped you know build a part of me today there was sort of very shallow you know, without a judgment on myself, but like very shallow sort of interactions mm. with myself and my feelings and my, um, yeah. the time or the care I took to be cognizant of why, while I, why I was feeling these ways and why I was looking for um, fulfillment in other ways. And then I think on the other side, um, you know, self-worth and self-value was huge. Like I, I think I yeah. didn't, as much as I was, running around the world doing things as well you know like I don't know if I really had any self sort of worth or value and I mean that I think that's clear mm. because it took really until the last few years with the breakdown and all the things that happened around that mm. to actually finally see that and and actually kind of to the like the light and the dark that we spoke about earlier I was always looking at what I didn't have yeah. in myself yeah. but actually not seeing you know, what I what did had, have. what yeah. I did have. And, you know, yeah. I, I'm not sure, again, if we're kind of recapping on things that maybe people have heard or whatever, but, you know, I think through through those three years in that narcissistic relationship, you know, there were many times that I feel like there were, you know, fights or arguments or ca gaslighting situations or whatever that were activated that made me r really sort of... Um, you know, and, and there was a breakup or a separation or a sort of something that would happen that would basically bring up this, all this shit in me that was like, I am worth nothing. I'm 40 years old. I have nothing. I've got to get a boyfriend, start again. You know, I've got no self-worth, no value. And again, this is all older narrative language, but, you know, I didn't, didn't see that, you know, I had traveled the world. I had a company. I had, you know, yeah. done amazing big events. I, I have a, I'm a great friend. I, you know, I um, supported lots of people in the journeys, like, you know, millions of things on small and large yeah. levels. Like I couldn't see any of that because I was so stuck in what I couldn't see. And really that was, mm -hmm. I didn't have a boyfriend and it was as simple as that, which is pretty yeah. to say out loud. <laughs> but, um, and how would you, know, you practice what do you <laughs> How, how would you practice unconditional happiness around that now? I would say, Tony, that you are amazing. <laughs> and I'm getting all teary. <laughs> um, and that you, like part of your beauty is, is your scars and who you are yeah. and what you did. And whilst you made some maybe not so great decisions and maybe not so... Um, you know, great explorations of yourself that it's brought you to who you are today and that you actually have mm -hmm. a lot to offer. And part of the depth and the beauty of who you are is based on, you know, what you went through. And, um, mm -hmm. and now you can apply that happiness and love of like, you have everything you need. And you also have a lot of tools about discernment and, mm -hmm. you know, trusting your intuition more which has served you and bringing you mm. so many other gifts that you never knew were available to you um and you know have a bit of fucking humor and laugh and just be like mm. you know that's that's what happened and now it's not happening anymore and that's a great thing mm. yeah <laughs> and it happens how it was i guess supposed to happen I hate yeah. it when I, I hate it when I hate it when people say that to me because I'm like, what do you mean? I was supposed to fucking happen that way. But then I go, unconditional happiness would mean that you learned what you had to learn. 
Yes. And, you know, the subtle lessons where you could have learned it, like maybe five or 10 years ago, you chose to ignore them or you, you just yes. didn't, you, right? Yes. And, you yeah. know, that's happened to me as well. It's kind of like, we always think the grass is always greener or you kind of go, oh, I don't know. But with the value of hindsight, you always kind of go, yeah, I could have learned that lesson a long time ago. Yeah, like I really was, could have, yeah. Yeah, it was, um, it was definitely coming up for me a lot earlier, like years and years and years and years and years ago. Yeah. Like I can yeah. see it clearly. But, I, you know, I also, yeah. I think, wouldn't have had the evolution of self in other ways to have either been able to handle making such a huge break and, and, and also, um, you know, maybe I wasn't as developed in my self-worth and my, you know, value and, and, and even understanding what that was, you know, like, I mean, it is, it's divine timing and all the things that were so many elements mm -hmm. that I wasn't even, you know, educated or informed about so that, you know, those lessons couldn't really take true, true form because I wasn't in a place to sort of receive them. And uh, there's still <laughs> work to be done on, at, you know, the foundational level to even get me to that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Funny. <laughs> All right. What about... Um, funny now. <laughs> yeah, funny now. Definitely funny at, now. At the, time, at the time, though. Not so funny. And, you know, really funny to look back at how it has been yeah. across so many years. But, yeah. you know, but that's fine, too. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Younger lessons for yourself at, like, you know, now, like, present day, you know, the last five years or something in terms of, like, how your life has changed so beautifully around you know your study mm -hmm. and you know exploring a different career change and tell us yeah um maybe i think that like there are two things around that one would be you're probably ready to do it even though you think you're not mm -hmm. and then the the other thing like i wish i would have spent the money on the personal development in my twenties. Like that's mm -hmm. the biggest thing. If I look at everything, if, you know, if I look at all the designer mm -hmm. <laughs> things that everyone has and all the beauty treatments, like, you know what I mean? When you go, if you yeah. were to take all your beauty treatments for one year or, you know, half the shoes or half the designer shoes that you buy or half the designer handbags or the wardrobe or whatever, if you were to take all of that and spend that on yourself when you're in your twenties, how different would your how different would your life have been? Like, I... <laughs> but maybe I mean yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes, and but also to the same element. Like I think, you know, I think speaking for us both to some degree, like I think mm. the beauty of the work that we do today is that we mm. can speak about what we went through, and if we didn't go through those things, we wouldn't have anything to speak about. <laughs> And, I, know, I wouldn't because, mind that scenario <laughs> <laughs> but then what you wouldn't be doing this new job you know you wouldn't be we wouldn't be having this conversation now if we hadn't have yeah. been through those things and I yeah. think you know we all know that we learn through doing and we learn you know through mm. embodying things and I think you know we also learn the um the ways out of things by embodying and things mm. you know I, I think about myself in the event business like I wouldn't be the the quality event planner that I am if I hadn't had my ass bit from so many things along the way like I will never yeah, yeah. do you know and and I think maybe from a lot of ego or pride in my early days yeah. you know I was so mortified horrified embarrassed just destroyed when something went wrong and right. so on one level I was learning extreme ways of solution orientated you know recovery and crisis management and all those things but that was also within myself because you know I remember um one of my first jobs when I moved to the states I was working for this um I had a client that was sort of uh, out somewhere in the middle of rural Virginia or something like that and they were doing like a um 
a, a family picnic type thing, invite all their employees over and they had a couple of tents and a slide and, you know, blow up castle and all this sort of stuff. And I think in the diagram under the tent for the sort of picnic tables, I'd been drawing them as rectangles the whole time and, mm -hmm. you know, all of these things in mind. But anyway, when the truck turned out, the tables were round and the chairs were a different <laughs> color and everything was just different. And I just like panicked and was like, uh, and I remember going to the client and being like, the tables are different and everything's like, the chairs are wrong. And like, you know, first of all, you don't go to the client and say those things. Second of all, many, many things. And, and in the end, they, they, um, you know, kind of made a claim that I didn't really know what I was doing and that I wasn't very, okay. you know, confident. And they claimed to get some money back because I didn't handle things very well. And, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I feel like personally, they took a little slight advantage of my, yeah. naivety and, and, and other things because yeah. at the end of the day the tables were perfect and it was all great yeah. but the learning for me was like you know when something goes wrong it's sort of assessing it and how do you speak about it and in hindsight yeah. you know I would go to the client and be like so you know the truck came with different tables than we thought you know or I think they look great you know but I've got some others coming yeah. whatever you want to pay for you know I would have a different reaction yeah. to it of course so the only way you learn all that stuff is to you know get like from experience you know what I mean have those experiences <laughs> yeah and so I think that has developed me personally and professionally in such a way yeah. that I've enjoyed and so I think you know also through the the relationship stuff and, and interactions whether it's you know romantic or friends or, or work the only way we can really learn is by having these sort of, you know, contrasting moments that make us, as we go through our own journey of awareness, makes us look at ourselves and be like, okay, was that my shit, their shit? You mm. know, how could I be different? You know, how would I approach it next time? You know, discernment, all of those things. So, mm. yeah, I, I still think investing in myself in some sort of therapy and elements like that at a younger age would have been amazing too, no question. Mm. Yeah, something, even if it was just around the self-worth, I think the, the yes. kind of um, associating with self, acknowledging self-achievements, just around self-worth. And I think that could have, you know, I'm always looking for the quickest way to do things. <laughs> <laughs> um, Skip ahead. Yeah, I think, I think it says something too about, um, you know, where I feel like today's society is and even the opportunities for us as, as mm -hmm. leaders and us as um, people that want to make a difference in people's lives of how do we get to the kids and get to, mm -hmm. you know, teenagers and things like that to teach them about self-worth so they're not, you know, getting to 40 mm -hmm. and going through something that we have and, and, and did. And um, that for me feels like a huge part. I know I bring that up a lot, but like there's got to be really simple ways that, you know, and, and I mm -hmm. think it's more than just like Instagram you know, sayings and Instagram things. It's really, you know, about school programming. It's really about re-education for the parents. I mean, mm. it's it's on so many levels that I think that we can impact the younger people to, to teach them about themselves, to actually sort of shift their, you know, I don't want to say as much as like shift their mindset, but just to see, have them see actually of like what they have achieved versus, you know, the other mm. side of the, the scale, or the sort of coin yeah um okay so for me i would say um definitely self-development at an earlier stage in in yeah. you know is something that um i would share with my younger self of like just begin to learn and to notice mm -hmm. and be curious in a different yeah. way about how you feel and why you feel like that you know i think yeah. i covered a lot of my feelings and a lot of my um, uncomfortableness with, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll and, yeah. you know, handbags and shoes. And <laughs> uh, I would also suggest, um, you know, connect with your family and um, mm. stay open to you know listening and learning and 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 you know there's so much wisdom and, and information and even just like sort of the oral history of our families you know we often don't um we don't 
kind of really ask our grandparents and our families mm. and our parents and things like all these questions and all this beautiful stuff that I now wish like I had have known mm. what was their favorite song and you know how did they meet mm. and all of these stories and I think you know really um spending some time in an in, in a historical element of learning mm. about your family background and where you come from I think is really important and I would also say um for me explore creativity and understand what that means you know I think mm. as humans our our sort of um I think abundance and our path to abundance and our uh, connection with source is all very much connected to, to creativity and the expression of, and the ability to, you know, see it, feel it, you know, and I didn't really mm. have any taste for that when I was younger or understanding that I could do that or what would that would look like. So I would definitely sort of put that in the mix of like, mm. you know, go explore, make things plain travel. And maybe I was doing it in different ways through travel or something like that. But um, I definitely would say cooking. That, yeah, Do you think you were creative with cooking. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yep, yep. Um, that's a good one. And uh, you know, kind of get in with my hands more on something. You know, get my hands into the earth. Get my hands into, you know, that feeling of like being more connected to the earth. You know, I would definitely put it out there. You know, to be more connected in the the moon and, and the transits and things like that you know I think of something I didn't really it's interesting now as I as I kind of navigate menopause and, and pre-menopause and we've spoken about this briefly in different ways that very much when I was younger I used to skip my periods a lot and kind of have the you know, use the pill to be able to skip the sort of physical bleeding and things because I was too busy partying or traveling or whatever. And, and whilst, you know, I'm gentle with myself around this conversation that I, I didn't do anything to cause mm. this in a later life. I do think that mm. having a different relationship with my body at a, mm. as a younger woman would, would have been beautiful and, and I can't take mm -hmm. it back and I can't yeah. change it. And I can't also, you know, unconditionally love myself using unconditional love like you know beat myself up for what it did or didn't cause but I do think you know mm -hmm. having a relationship with my body I didn't really know what that even meant mm -hmm. and, and what you could do you know I wasn't aware of it in any sense of um you know what what it meant for how I was going to grow up with this body and and have such a long relationship and journey with it, like how I fed it, how I treated it, how I spoke to it and all yeah. of those things. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and it's one of those things where I think a lot of women and I think men nowadays as well, as they have, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the expectation is to have a six pack, like you look at your body and, and you do that, <laughs> you do that gap analysis. So if you kind of go, well, my hair is not long enough or my eyelashes aren't long enough or I don't mm. have a six pack or whatever as opposed to going, well, actually my body carried me throughout the day yesterday. Mm. I went through these restorative sleep processes. It does, your body does so much for you. And yes. when, when was the last time you actually showed your body some love? <laughs> yeah. 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 Nourished it, fed it, spoke to it, you know, bathed it, rested it. That's definitely, that's been a huge shift for me, especially when I think about how I abused my body when I was younger you know, mm -hmm. running around drinking and partying and never sleeping and, you know, all these things. So it's, it's been a, it's been an interesting journey. That's for sure. It has. Mm. Well, any last thoughts for your younger self as we wrap up this week's call of unconditional happiness? Yeah. Just, um, every time you're in a situation, um, it would be, remember to feel remember the heart mind mm. body connection mm. uh and i've been told i'm a robot sometimes so remember yeah. to feel yeah. um and just you know when you do feel your heart closing um keep it open and just think about unconditional happiness and i've had people you know i've always read you know imagine as though you'd chosen every moment of life as your own I was like well if I have a choice I wouldn't have chosen it but um the practice 
the practice of unconditional happiness, it's easy for me to understand that as opposed to imagine choosing it as if you'd chosen it yourself. So just yeah, so, say what that means again. Unconditional so, happiness? No, no, the bit of like choosing the, it versus. Yeah. So I would have people, uh, I think I, I've read, you know, in terms of spiritual enlightenment, um, every in, live life as though you'd chosen every single moment mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as though you'd actually willed it to be that way right and it's like well i wouldn't if i had a choice i wouldn't will it to be that way because if i had a choice clearly i'd choose something different if it wasn't making me happy yeah but pra but practicing unconditional happiness would be is to have no judgment on what is unfolding as opposed to having a choice over how it unfolds. So the first one would be having a choice over how it unfolds, which means that I'd want it to be different. Whereas mm -hmm. the second one would be um, just being happy without labeling it or without judging the situation mm. or true acceptance. Yeah, so interesting. And I mean, it feeds into what we said because I, I mean, essentially, you know, there are, folks that say that we call in the experiences that we've had to yep. learn the lessons that we're meant to have. So therefore you did choose everything that happened to you to some degree. <laughs> and I'm laughing at myself, you know, like I chose all of the things that happened to, to bring me to this moment. So therefore part of like the concept of like in this moment now or in the present moment is like, you can't be mad at all that because you chose it. So it's accepting it. Mm and knowing that that's what's brought you to be at this place. And then from there, you can only do your best to choose differently going forward with awareness and with, you know, an open heart. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I still have a problem with the word choice. <laughs> Go on, tell me what that. I'd rather, I would rather practice, um, practice unconditional happiness than saying that I'd chosen something. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think everything is a practice and how, yes, yeah, so we're practicing unconditional love and unconditional happiness, which is bringing about certain um, experiences versus um, like going about, like we, ha we have a choice that we're dictating and we're like the ones in yeah. charge. Yeah. That's and maybe it's my ones. ego that's triggered. Yeah. Maybe it's my ego that's triggered. But um, where, whereas if you're practicing unconditional love or unconditional happiness, there's an element of surrender, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which I think yeah. is easier for me, you know, tapping into my body. I feel like it's easier to practice that than it is to say I've chosen this. Yes. Yes. I think there are choices to make. Yeah, Definitely as you go through your practice, you know, in this moment, yeah. I choose not to allow my ego to drive this conversation or, or to, to, I choose my reaction <laughs> or something like that. But yeah, I'm with you. It's amazing. I mean, it's so intricate, but important to be intricate because I think, again, if we are calling in our future by our thoughts and our words, then why not make mm. this specific and, and um, mm. you know, particular. And it might land differently for somebody if they hear the different ways it's said mm. as well, mm. which is really important. Yeah, I love so it. So, any any closing comments from you, Tony, on the matter? I would say um, just remember that we're all you know, humans having this human experience looking to basically do something. And when we rub us, you know, come together in some sort of way of, of um, interaction that you've got, you know, two sides of the story and two feelings and not to assume, you know, four agreements. Mm -hmm. I think maybe learning the four agreements, you know, from an mm -hmm. earlier age would have been certainly something that, um, that would have given me a bit more uh, comfort or peace than just like running around making wild accusations at people because I was assuming and taking things personally and like living in a state of, you know, fear. 
but that's yeah the, I have unconditional love for my previous states <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing you're right there's something about not making assumptions about the other person because yeah, often I mean, everyone's often they're wrong often often like yes. pretty much always yes yes on both sides for sure amazing mm -hmm. well thank you everybody for um joining us this week on our live chat dive into the mind with helen and pony and um we love talking about this stuff so we will see you when we see you and um thanks very much for joining us lots of love thank you bye see you later, babes. thank you bye